Section 4, Creating the Constitution. Picture the scene. It is hot, sweltering, in fact, yet all the windows of the state house are closed and shuttered to discourage eavesdroppers. Outside, soldiers keep curious onlookers and others at a distance. Inside, the atmosphere is frequently tense, as 50 or so men exchange sometimes heated views. Indeed, some who are there become so upset that they threaten to leave the hall, and a few actually do so. This was often the scene at the Philadelphia meeting, which finally began on May 25, 1787. Over the long summer months until mid-September, the framers of what was to become the Constitution worked to build a new government that could meet the needs of the nation. In this section, you'll consider that meeting and its outcome. The Framers. Twelve of the thirteen states, all but Rhode Island, sent delegates to Philadelphia. In total, 74 delegates were chosen by the legislatures in those 12 states. For a number of reasons, however, only 50 of them actually attended the convention. Of that 55, this much can be said. Never before or since has so remarkable a group been brought together in this country. Thomas Jefferson, who was not among them, later called the delegates an assembly of demigods. The delegates who attended the Philadelphia Convention, known as the Framers of the Constitution, included many outstanding individuals. These were men of wide knowledge and public experience. Many of them had fought in the Revolution. Forty-six had been members of the Constitutional Congress or the Congress of the Confederation, or both. Eight had served in constitutional conventions in their own states, and seven had been state governors. Eight had signed the Declaration of Independence. Thirty-four of the delegates had attended college in a day when there were few, but the, when there were but a few colleges in the land. Two were to become presidents of the United States, and one a vice president. Nineteen later served in the Senate, and thirteen in the House of Representatives. Is it any wonder that the product of such a gathering was described by the English statesman William E. Gladstone nearly a century later as the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man? Remarkably, the average age of the delegates was only 42, and most of the leaders were in their 30s. James Madison was 36, Governor Morris 35, Edmund Randolph 34, and Alexander Hamilton 30. At 81, Benjamin Franklin was the oldest. His health was failing. However, he was not able to attend many of the meetings. George Washington, at 55, was one of the few older members who played a key role at the convention. Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey was, at 26, the youngest delegate. By and large, the framers of the Constitution were of a new generation in American politics. Several of the leaders of the revolutionary period were not in Philadelphia. Patrick Henry that he smelt a rat and refused to attend. Samuel Adams and John Hancock and Richard Henry Lee were not selected as delegates by their states. Thomas Paine was in Paris. So was Thomas Jefferson. As American minister into France, John Adams was the envoy to England and Holland at the time. Organization and procedure. The framers met in the State House, now Independence Hall, probably in the same room in which the Declaration of Independence had been signed 11 years earlier. They organized immediately on May 25, unanimously electing George Washington as president of the convention. Then, at the second session on Monday, May 28, they adopted several rules of procedure. A ma majority of the states would be needed to conduct business. Each state delegation was to have one vote on all matters, and a majority of the votes cast would carry any proposal. The framers met on 92 of the 116 days from May 25 through their final meeting on September 17. They did most of their work on the floor of the convention. They handled some matters in committees, but the full body ultimately settled all questions. A momentous decision. Remember Congress had called the Philadelphia Convention for the sole and express purpose of re recommending revisions to the Articles of Confederation? However, almost at once the delegates agreed that they were meeting to create an entirely new government for the United States. On May 30, they adopted this proposal. Resolved that a national government ought to be established consisting of a supreme legislative, executive, and judiciary. Edmund Randolph, delegate from Virginia. With this momentous decision, the framers have redefined the purpose of the convention. From that point on, they set about writing a new constitution intended to replace the Articles of Confederation. However, much that would go into this new constitution would come directly from the Articles of Confederation. Their debates were spirited, even bitter. At times, the convention seemed near collapse. Once they had passed Randolph's resolution, however, the resolve of most of the delegates never wavered. Proposals. Once the framers resolved to 
to replace the Articles of Confederation, two major plans were offered for the new government, the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan. Virginia Plan No state had more to do with the calling of a convention than Virginia. It was not surprising then that its delegates should offer the first plan for a new constitution. On May 29, the Virginia Plan, largely the work of Madison, was presented by Randolph. The Virginia plan called for a new government with three separate branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislature, Congress, would be a bicameral. Representation in each house was to be based either on each state's population or on the amount of money it gave for the support of the central government. The members of the lower house, the House of Representatives, were to be popularly elected in each state. Those of the upper house, the Senate, were to be chosen by the house from lists of persons nominated by the state legislatures. Congress was to be given all of the powers it held under the Articles. In addition, it would have the power to legislate in all cases to which the separate states are incompetent, to act to veto any state law in conflict with national law, and to use force if necessary to make a state obey national law. Under the proposed Virginia plan, Congress would choose a national executive and a national judiciary. Together, these two branches would form a council of revision. They could veto acts passed by Congress, but a veto could be overridden by the two houses. The executive would have a general authority to execute the national laws. The judiciary would consist of one or more supreme tribunals, courts, and of inferior tribunals. The Virginia plan also provided that all state officers would take an oath to support the Union and that each state be guaranteed a Republican form of government. Under the plan, Congress would have the exclusive power to admit new states to the Union. The Virginia plan then would create a new constitution by thoroughly revising the Articles. Its goal was the creation of a truly national government with greatly expanded powers and importantly the power to enforce its decisions. The Virginia plan set the agenda for much of the convention's work, but some delegates, especially those from New York and the smaller states of Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey, found it too radical. Soon they developed their counterproposals. On June 15, William Patterson of New Jersey presented the position of the small states. The New Jersey plan. Patterson and his colleagues offered several amendments to the articles, but not nearly so thorough a revision as proposed by the Virginia plan. The New Jersey plan retained the unicameral Congress of the Confederation with each of the states equally represented. In addition to those powers, Congress already had the plan would add closely limited powers to tax and regulate trade between the states. The New Jersey plan also called for a federal executive of more than one person. The spoil executive would be chosen by Congress and could be removed by it at the request of a majority of the state's governors. The federal judiciary would be composed of a single supreme tribunal appointed by the executive. Among their several differences, the major point of disagreement between the two plans centered on this question. How should the states be represented in Congress? Would it be on the basis of their population or financial contributions as in the Virginia plan? Or would it be on the basis of state equality as in the Articles and the New Jersey plan? For weeks, the delegates returned to this conflict debating the matter again and again. The lines were sharply drawn. Several delegates on both sides of the say of the issue threatened to withdraw. Finally, this was, dispute was settled by one of the key compromises the framers were to make as they built the Constitution. Compromises. The disagreement over representation in Congress was critical. The larger states expected it to dominate the new government. The smaller states feared that they would not be able to protect their interests. Tempers flared on both sides. The debate became so intense that Benjamin Franklin was moved to suggest that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Connecticut Compromise The conflict was settled by a compromise suggested by the Connecticut delegation. In the Connecticut Compromise, it was agreed that Congress should be composed of two houses. In the smaller Senate, the states would be represented equally. In the House, the representatives of each state would be based upon its population. By combining basic features of the plans, the Convention's most serious dispute was resolved. The agreement satisfied the smaller states in particular, allowing them to support the creation of a strong central government. The Connecticut Compromise was so pivotal to the writing of the Constitution that has often been called the Great Compromise. 
Three-fifths compromise. Once it had been agreed to base the seats in the House on each state's population, this question arose. Should slaves be counted in figuring the populations of the states? Again, debate was fierce. Most delegates from the southern states argued that slaves should be counted. Most of the northerners taking the opposing, took the opposing view. All could see the contradictions between slavery and the sentiments expressed in the de- Declaration of Independence, that slavery was legal in every state except Massachusetts. The slave population was concentrated in the southern states, however, as you can see from the map on this page. Finally, the framers agreed to the three-fifths compromise. It provided that all free persons should be counted, and so too should three-fifths of all other persons. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3. For all other persons, red slaves. For the three-fifths won by the southerners, the north exacted a price. That formula was also to be used in fixing the amount of money to be raised in each state. By any direct tax levied by Congress, in short, the Southerners could count their slaves, but they would have to pay for them. This odd compromise disappeared from the Constitution with the adoption of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery in 1865. For nearly 150 years, there have been no all other persons in this country. Commerce and the Slave Trade Compromise The framers generally agreed that Congress must have the power to regulate foreign and interstate trade. To many Southerners, that power carried a real danger, however. They worried that Congress, likely to be controlled by Northern commercial interests, would act against the interests of the agricultural South. They were particularly fearful that the Congress would try to pay for the new government out of export duties, and Southern tobacco was the major American export of the time. They also feared that Congress would interfere with the slave trade. Before they would agree to the commerce power, the Southerners insisted on certain protections. So according to the Commerce and Slave Trade Compromise, Congress was forbidden to power the power to tax the export of goods from any state. It was also forbidden the power to act on the slave trade for a period of at least 20 years. It could not interfere with the migration or importation of such persons as any state now existing shall think proper to admit, except for a small head tax at least until the year 1808. A bundle of compromises. The convention spent much of its time, said Franklin, sawing boards and make to make them fit. The constitution drafted at Philadelphia has often been called a bundle of compromises. Those descriptions are apt as they are properly understood. There were differences of opinion among the delegates, certainly. After all, the delegates came from 12 different states, widely separated in geographic and economic terms, and the delegates often reflected the particular interests of their own states. Bringing those interests together did require a compromise. Indeed, final decisions on issues such as the selection of the president and the treaty-making process, the structure of the national court system, and the amendment process were all reached by a result of compromise. But no means did all or even most of what shaped the document come from compromise. The framers were agreed on many of the basic issues they faced. Thus, nearly all the delegates were convinced that a new national government, a federal government, had to be created, and that had to have the powers necessary to deal with the nation's grave social and economic problems. The framers were also dedicated to the concepts of popular sovereignty and limited government. None questioned for a moment the wisdom of representative government. The principles of separation of powers and of checks and balances were accepted almost as a matter of course. Many disputes did occur, and the compromises by which they were resolved came only after hours, days, and even weeks of heated debate. The point here, however, is that the differences were not over the most fundamental of questions. They involved instead such a vital but lesser points as these. The details of the structure of Congress, the method by which the president was to be chosen, and the practical limits that should be put on several powers to be given to the new central government. For several weeks, through the hot Philadelphia summer, the delegates took up resolution after resolution. On September 8, a committee was named to revise the style of and arrange the articles which had been agreed to by the convention. That committee, the Committee of Style and Arrangement, put the Constitution into its final form. Finally, on September 17, the convention approved its work and 39 names were placed on the finished document. Because not all of the delegates were willing to sign the Constitution, its final paragraph was very carefully worded to give the impression of the unanimity. Done in convention by the unanimity 
unanimous consent of the states present. Perhaps none of the framers was completely satisfied with their work. Nevertheless, wise old Benjamin Franklin put into words that what many of them must have thought on that final day. Sir, I agree with this constitution with all its faults, if they are such, because I think a general government necessary for us. I doubt whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better constitution. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. From such an assembly can a perfect production be expected. If there astonishes me, sir, I find the system approaching so near to perfection as it does. Notes of debates in the Federal Convention in 1787, James Madison. On Franklin's notion, the Constitution was signed. Madison tells us that, Dr. Franklin, looking towards the president's chair at the back of which the rising sun happened to be painted, observed to a few members near him that painters had found it difficult to distinguish in their art a rising sun from a setting sun. I have, said he, often and often in the course of the session looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now at length I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. Notes of Debates in the Federal Convention of 1787, James Madison.